טוב. אוקיי, okay, בוקר טוב. Uh, אני אעבור לאנגלית כי ביקשו ממני לדבר באנגלית, אז uh, good morning. I'm also going to stand here and on in the stage because my feeling is that 9 in the morning is a little bit hard for uh, technical details and if I move around at least maybe that will keep people with me. So uh, hopefully that will help. Um, all right, so what I want to talk about today is some ideas that we've been working on in our group in recent years where our goal is to develop A to D converters, analog to digital converters, that work at sub Nyquist rates, meaning we want to be able to sample signals at rates that are much lower than the standard Nyquist rate. Okay, so this might sound like something that's impossible, but what I'll try to convince you today in the 35, 40 minutes that I have is that it's possible both theoretically and in practice. So even though we're from academia, uh, besides only developing the theory, we've actually also built prototypes that show that this is actually something that is feasible And we're also working with several companies to actually work these ideas into a technology. So hopefully if things go well in a few years, you'll be able to see these things actually in the market. Okay, so let me begin. Um, all right, so as we know, we're all in the midst of the digital revolution. We like to generate more and more digital data. We like to do our processing in the digital domain. But if we want to be able to digitally process continuous time signals, we have to have a way to go from the continuous time, the real physical world, into the digital domain. Okay, and this is captured really nicely by this uh, very well-known song of Alonon Olaarchik, Ani Bachur Analogi Be'olam Digitali. Right, this is exactly what we're talking about. So really the world is analog, it's continuous time, but we like to pretend that it's all digital. And in order for that pretendence to be real, we have to have a way to move to the digital domain while preserving the information. So the standard way of doing that, of course, is to use an analog to digital converter. And as we all know, All A to D converters today in the market are built on the well-known Shannon-Nyquist theorem. Okay, so here is Shannon and here is Nyquist that states that in order to be able to move from the continuous domain to the digital domain, you have to sample the signals at twice their highest frequency. Okay, so this is a very well-known uh, basic fact that we teach in all basic digital signal processing courses. And of course, this theorem is very fundamental. So this theorem actually enabled the digital revolution. Okay, it allowed us to move to the digital domain without losing information. So that's the good news. The problem is that as we look ahead at modern applications, since we know how to move to digital, we want to be able to do it with wider and wider signals, wider and wider bandwidth, more and more bits, and that starts becoming very difficult. So in modern applications, very often the signals that we want to process have bandwidth is on the order of several gigahertz, and that's already very hard to do based on the Shannon-Nyquist theorem. So in order to get to those high rates, we have to use very excessive hardware solutions, different types of interleave structures. I don't want to go into the details, but these are pretty difficult to do in hardware. And these are also limited by the analog bandwidth. So there's just so much that we could push in order to sampling at these high rates. The other problem is that even if somehow we manage to sample at these high rates, so we manage to go from the analog to the digital, we end up with millions and millions of samples that we have to process. Okay, so we used to think of digital as being free, but today that's no longer the case. And so when we get to these very high rates, we start running into difficulties on the digital chips as well. So both the high analog rates and the high DSP rates are really a bottleneck today in any standard DSP application. Okay, so really these ADCs that from a digital signal processing perspective we used to ignore are today becoming a major bottleneck. And we really have to go back and think about how maybe we can do this a little bit differently. Okay, so how do things work today? Right at the end, we have a lot of digital applications, so how do these work? Well, to get this to work, we have what I call the separation theorem, and this isn't a mathematical theorem, but rather a separation between classes of people. So at least in academia, this is true, and I think somewhat also in industry. So we have two classes of people. We have analog design experts, and these are people that work very, very hard in order to design circuits that could sample wider and wider signals and basically give us more and more bits. Okay, so they, they work very hard to design uh, these circuits, preferably using as, as less power as possible. And then at the other side of the room, and if this is in academia, it's usually in a completely different building, we have the DSP people or the machine learning people, which I am one of them, where what we try to do is get all this massive amount of data and make sense out of it, right? We try to process it. Now, the first thing that you do today in any modern DSP application is you throw away the data. Okay, and this is the first thing that's done in any application. Now, of course, we don't just take the data and throw it away, right? We do it in a smart way. So we use different terminology like um, dimension dimensionality reduction, feature extraction, parameter estimation, 
All of these words are basically nice words of saying, we have too much data, we don't need all of this data. The data that we actually need is in a much smaller set. And therefore, on the DSP side, we have, again, many people who are sitting there coming up with algorithms that allow us to take this massive amount of data and basically reduce it. Now, if you think about this from kind of a holistic point of view, right, this is a huge waste of energy. So we have people investing tons of energy and power into giving us more and more bits, and then we're investing the same amount of energy and power into throwing away all of those bits that we were given. Okay, so if you think about it, that doesn't make sense, right? If we could throw away the bits at the end, that means that to begin with, we didn't actually need all of that information. And this is really the premise of what we're trying to be promoting in the past few years, is that if you could throw it away at the end, and we know that we can because all algorithms today do that, all algorithms today throw away data, then that means that we could have thrown it away at the beginning. So there was no reason to sample all of that to begin with. And that's really what we're trying to talk about. So how do we exploit the structure that we know that exists, instead of only doing it at the last step, how do we exploit that structure all the way at the first step and only sample the part of the signal that contains the relevant information? Okay, now of course if we can do that, then we can get tremendous savings in terms of power, in terms of processing, in terms of storage, right? So we could save enormous amounts if to begin with we would only sample the part of the signal that we need. And of course, the challenge is how do we do that? And that's what I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk. So just to formulate the idea again, what we're going to do is exploit structure in the analog signal, not in the digital domain, but all the way in the analog domain. And of course, like I said, if we could do that, then we could reduce storage, we could reduce sampling rates, we could reduce processing rates and power consumption. The other side of the coin is that if we know how to exploit structure, we could get other benefits as well. So we could increase resolution, we could get better denoising capabilities, source separation capabilities. So a lot of the digital processing techniques will be improved as well if we know how to correctly exploit the structure in the data. So in the time I have left, I'm going to focus primarily on reducing sampling rates, since that's the title of the talk. But keep in mind that the same types of algorithms and the same structure could also be used in order to get these other benefits as well. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is try to keep this kind of high level just to get the main ideas across. So we'll give a variety of different applications where these ideas could be relevant, and we'll show some examples of the advantages we could get. And like I said, I'm going to keep it on a very high level, but those of you concerned about the proofs, I promise you there's a lot of mathematics behind it, and you could go ahead and take a look at the references. So everything I'm going to say is actually also proven, but we're going to try to keep it um, as high level as possible. So here's a more detailed outline of what I'll talk about. I'll start by giving motivation by looking at different applications and showing why we think that there is structure that we could exploit and how we expect to do that. We'll then go into a little bit more detail about the types of signals that we're going to be addressing. And then we're going to introduce our new paradigm that we call sampling. So sampling is basically a combination of compression and sampling done simultaneously. Okay, because the way we sample the data, we do it in such a way that we only sample the relevant parts. So we're basically compressing while we're sampling. Okay, and therefore we call this sampling. Okay, and then depending on time, we'll go some specific applications. So we'll see how we could use these ideas in cognitive radio, in ultrasound, in radar, in multipath identification. And then we'll say two words about how we could use these ideas in a variety of different nonlinear settings. For example, in different phase retrieval problems that we get often in optics. OK, so just two words on what is known in sampling theory before we go into kind of these modern ideas. So everyone hopefully knows the shannon Nyquist theorem, and if not, we already stated it. But there's been a lot of work in the sampling theory, and mainly in the mathematical literature, since this original uh, shannon Nyquist theorem until, let's say, a few years ago, where we started coming up with these sub Nyquist ideas. So I'm not going to go through the technical details, but let me just, in two words, try to summarize a lot of this work that was done. So in a nutshell, what people have shown over the past 60 years or so is that you can extend the basic shannon Nyquist theorem to any subspace, meaning if you know that your signal lies in some subspace, and it could be an arbitrary subspace, not necessarily the subspace of band-limited signals. So if you know that your signal lies in a subspace, then you could sample it using almost arbitrary sampling filter, and you're guaranteed that you could recover it perfectly as long as you do some correction step in the digital domain. OK, so I'm not going through the technicalities. You could find the details in the references. But the important thing for the rest of our talk is that if you know that the signal lies in the subspace, in any subspace, then sampling theory knows how to sample it and knows how to recover it efficiently. 
What's more, we also know, and this is work that we've done a few years ago, we also know how to extend this to nonlinear sampling. So even if you had nonlinearities in your sampling device, which happens in many modern applications, okay, definitely in different optical applications, but also when using microphones or different power amplifiers. So in many applications, you have nonlinearities. And what we were able to show is that even when you have nonlinearities, this essential result is still true. So if your signal lies in a subspace, you could recover it perfectly even when you have nonlinearities, and you don't have to increase the sampling rate. Okay, so this is kind of known results from uh, until a few years ago. And like I said, I'm not going through the details, but those of you interested could find it in a review that we wrote on kind of modern sampling theory until about four or five years ago. So the moral of the story up to this point is that if our signal lies in a subspace, we know how to sample it and we know how to recover it. Okay, so that sounds pretty general, right? Because at least in signal processing, we like to work in subspaces. So it sounds like we could almost do anything. What's the problem then? Well, the problem is, like I said to begin with, that subspaces don't capture enough of the information in the signal. And they basically force us to work at very high sampling rates. So let me now give a few examples to convince you what, that this is actually the case. So let's start with this multiband problem. So suppose that you have a scenario where at the receiver, you receive several bands of information. Each band is pretty narrow, but these could be spread over a very wide regime. Okay, and this problem appears a lot, definitely in different defense applications, but it also appears a lot in cognitive radio, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So, of course, any signal of this form, you could view as being band limited to some F max, and therefore you could sample the signal at F max, which is the Nyquist rate. Okay, so you could always do that, but just by looking at the signal, it's obvious that that will be wasteful, right? Because when you sample at the Nyquist rate, you're assuming that the signal has energy from zero to F max while any signal that of our form will only have energy in a narrow set of bands. Okay, so clearly sampling at the Nyquist rate will be oversampling. But on the other hand, if you don't know these carrier frequencies, okay, if you know them, the problem is easy, right? You could demodulate each band and sample it at a low rate. But if you don't know the carrier frequencies, then it's not clear how you could sample at a rate lower than Nyquist, right? Because Conceptually, you have to scan the entire regime since you don't know where they are, and therefore you're back at the Nyquist rate. And in fact, mathematically, if you try to describe the signal by a subspace, the smallest subspace that will describe these signals is the subspace of signals band limited to F max. Okay, so using traditional sampling results, you would conclude, and there are actually papers that wrongfully so conclude that, that signals of this form have to be sampled at F max because you don't know where the carriers are. But what we're going to see is that that's not true. We can actually exploit the fact that many of the bands here are zero in order to reduce the sampling rate, even though we don't know where the signal is. OK, but in order to do that, of course, the first question is, how do we even characterize these class of signals? And then how do we exploit that in order to reduce the sampling rate? OK, but before we go into the details, it should be obvious that there's a lot of structure here that we could exploit. The question just is how to exploit it. OK, another example. Oh, sorry. Before we go into another example, let me just say two words about cognitive radio. So one of the reasons why people are very interested in this problem is because of the area of cognitive radio. So the idea in cognitive radio is that even though almost all the spectrum is licensed, OK, so it looks like there's no more spectrum to exploit, it actually turns out that there's a lot of empty bands. So first of all, in any given time, not everyone is using the spectrum. OK, that's definitely true in, in other parts of the world. I don't know if that's true in Israel. Right here, people tend to have five phones that are always on. But um, in other parts of the world, at least, it is true that people are not using their frequency allocated to them all of the time. And <clears throat> regardless of that, there's white spaces like TV white spaces that are always empty. And the idea is that if you would be able to find where those empty spaces are, then you could track them and allow secondary users to use the channel when you're not using the channel. And of course, there's a huge potential here for the cellular companies to make more money, right? Because they charge the primary user, and then they would charge all the secondary users. So the cellular companies are very interested in this cognitive radio problem. There's many challenges with cognitive radio, but one of the major ones is the scanning problem, right? How do I know where those white band frequencies are, where those empty bands are, and how do I do that quickly? And if I have to sample at the Nyquist rate, then it's impossible, because the Nyquist rate here will be several gigahertz, and there's no way I could do that on a small cellular phone with the power I have in a cellular phone continuously. Okay, so the sensing part is a real challenge here. 
Okay, moving on to another example. So other areas where you get this type of structure is actually when you look at pulses in time. So a problem that appears in many different applications is the problem we see over here, where at the receiver, what we get is a stream of pulses, like we see over here. And what we don't know are the times of arrival and the amplitudes. OK, so this happens in many applications. One application, of course, is radar. In radar, I send a known pulse. And what I receive are the reflections of these pulses as they propagate from the targets. Right After they hit the target, they propagate back. And these times of arrival, in that case, will tell us the distance to the targets, whereas the amplitudes have the Doppler frequency shift in them, so they will tell us the velocity of the targets. OK, so that's one problem where this appears. I, another problem is in this multipath case. So in a wireless channel, unfortunately, besides only getting the line of sight that you want, you also get reflections from different obstacles, like we see over here. And therefore, at the receiver side, this is what you will get. So you have to be able to recover the delays and amplitudes in order to compensate for this multipath in the channel. OK, now one more area where this problem arises is in ultrasound. And I'll say more about that on the next slide. So there's many problems where the received signal has this form. And because this problem is so popular, there's been really tens of or hundreds of papers dedicated to how do you efficiently find these times of arrival and these amplitudes. And this is used today in many, many applications. But the difficulty, again, is that all of these methods require sampling at the Nyquist rate of the signal. Now, in these applications, because you want to get very good time resolution, the Nyquist rate tends to be very high because you try to send signals that are very, very narrow in time to get good time resolution, and therefore they have very wide bandwidth. OK, so the Nyquist rate here is very, very high. And this poses a real challenge. Now, when you think about it here, again, what is the Nyquist rate in this case? So the Nyquist rate of the received signal, of course, will be the same as the Nyquist rate of the pulse that you transmitted, right? because the delays and amplitudes don't change the bandwidth. And like we said, what you send is going to be very narrow, so the bandwidth is going to be very large. Now, when you think about it here, the pulse is something that you transmitted. So it's the part of the signal that you actually know. And therefore, what happens here is that you're sampling at a very high rate, OK, several gigahertz. But actually, all of that rate is going towards the part of the signal that you actually know, right? Because the pulse is something that you transmitted. So it's dictating a very high sampling rate. But there's no unknown information in it. You know all of it in advance. What you don't know are these delays in amplitudes. But they could be a small number of them. So for example, in this case, we have six unknown parameters. Okay, But the Nyquist rate tells us to sample at several gigahertz. So we have billions of samples where all we need to recover is six unknown parameters. Okay, So here again, you see that the Nyquist rate is not capturing the structure in the signal. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to sample at these very high rates, get these billions of samples that we have to process, only at the end to report six numbers. OK, that just doesn't make sense. But again, the question is, well, what else could we do? How else do we describe these signals? And how else could we sample them? So just one more example. Like I said, we get the same problem in ultrasound. And this is kind of an example that we've been working on for a few years, so I'm, I'm very fond of this particular example. Ultrasound is very similar to radar. So again, we send a pulse through the tissue. And what we're, what we're seeing are reflections of this, of this pulse as it propagates through the tissue. So it seems like it's the same as radar. But here, there's an additional complication. And that's that in ultrasound, the environment is extremely noisy. So if you actually look at one line, like I plotted over here, you see nothing. Okay, All you're going to see is noise. So what you have to do in practice is you have to use an uh, array of antennas. You can only use one. So in the ultrasonic probe, we basically have, in these probes that we're working with, we have 64 or 128 receivers for each line. So that basically we're sampling the signal not once, but 128 times. And then to form the image, we're basically taking all of this data and we're performing a process of what's called beamforming. So for those of you not familiar with beamforming, basically it's just a process to kind of align the signals and get an SNR improvement. Okay? But from a digital perspective, there's a lot of computation involved. So for every point in the image, we're basically taking the output of 128 receivers, doing shifts and combinations of all of this data to get one point in the image. And that's a tremendous amount of DSP. So in this application, really the bottleneck is not so much the sampling rate. Okay, the sampling rate in ultrasound is about 20 megahertz, which is fine. It's easy to buy A to D converters at 20 megahertz. But you have 128 of them, and you have to do all of this processing to the data. So this becomes very, very computationally intensive. 
And in fact, the motivation for this particular project that we're doing with GE was, and this was news to me, this was a surprise to me. So it turns out that one of the reasons that ultrasound machines are so big is because of this DSP. So because the DSP consumes so much power, you have fans in there that are cooling down the system. And that actually takes up the space. Okay, so when you think about it, right, it's kind of awkward because we're trying to scale things down, right? So we try to build chips that are smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you have these three mechanical fans that are just taking up all of your space. So the idea here was that if we could reduce the sampling and processing rates, then we could reduce the power, and even if we get rid of one or two of those fans, we could shrink down the size of the ultrasound machine without harming the resolution. Okay, and that was the goal in this project. So to move ahead, we've been focusing until now on sampling rate, but like I said, the other side of the coin is resolution. So we talked about, for example, sampling rate and radar, but another bigger problem in radar is the resolution. So to show the problem in resolution, let me just give a, a very small example, and those of you not familiar with radar, it's very easy to understand even without knowledge in radar. So what I'm plotting over here are true targets, these are these X's, and we're plotting them in what is called a delay Doppler plane. So basically every target here is marked by its delay, meaning its distance to the receiver, and its Doppler shift, which gives us the velocity of the target. Okay, so every point is a target with a given distance and a given velocity. Now what you see as the circles is the output of standard match filtering, which is the standard process to receive radar signals at the Nyquist rate. And we see that even though we're sampling at the Nyquist rate, okay, which is, like I said, several gigahertz, so there's an enormous amount of data here, we're still losing a lot in resolution. So you see that, for example, here we had two targets and we were only able to identify one, and then there's places where we have fake targets, so we identify targets even though they don't even exist. Okay, and of course, from a radar perspective, definitely when we're thinking about defense applications, this is a huge problem. Another problem where resolution is key is in the area of optics, and we've been working a lot in optical applications recently with collaborators at the Technion, so the groups of uh, Moti Segev and Oren Cohen. And here the problem is just a fundamental limitation of physics that has nothing to do with technology. So from basic limits in physics, we know that if we try to view detail with a certain wavelength, if we're using optics, then we can see detail that is finer than half the wavelength. So for example, if we're trying to look at these nanoholes, which are in the order of 100 nanometers, and we're using green light, which is around 500 nanometers, then we can not see below 250 nanometers, and therefore what we're going to see is just blurring of the image. And again, this isn't a technology limitation, it's a physical limitation. So in both of these examples, we had a resolution problem, which had nothing to do with sampling rate. Even if we sample at the Nyquist rate or beyond, we're still going to be resolution limited. And what we're going to see is that the exact same techniques that we use in order to reduce sampling rate could be used in order to increase resolution. So in both of these problems, this is the radar problem and the optics problems, using the techniques I'm going to introduce, we could get much better resolution. Here, here you see the output of our algorithm that perfectly identifies all of the targets, and here you see that we perfectly recover all of those nanoholes. Okay, so again, the key is exploiting structure. And if we know how to exploit structure in the analog signal, not in the digital domain, because after you sampled, you already lost part of the detail. If we know how to exploit it in the analog domain, we could get all of the benefits. We could both reduce the power, reduce the processing rate, and get better performance, as you see in this slide. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you, and now the question is, how do we actually do it? So what we're gonna do is two steps, and both of these steps are, are fairly easy. It's the combination that makes it work. So the first is that we're gonna move away from subspaces that we like so much in signal processing, and instead we're going to use a mathematical structure that's called a union of subspaces, and this is very simple, so those of you not very fond of math, don't worry, it's, it's really very simple. And then the next step is going to be to translate the map into concrete A to D converters, and we're going to do that using this sampling methodology. Okay, so it's really kind of the combination of using a different mathematical description and different sampling techniques that will give us the advantages we've seen before. Okay, so let's move ahead now and talk about how we mathematically characterize the signals that we're looking at. So let me move ahead straight away to an example, because I think it's easier to explain this through an example. So let's look at this multiband problem and remind ourselves what the essence of the problem was. So remember, we said as follows. We know that our signal has this form. So suppose I tell you in advance that my signal consists of three bands, but the, I don't know where those bands are. They could be anywhere over a wide spectrum. So you know that your signal looks like one of these options. Actually, there's infinitely many options, right? You could place those three bands anywhere. Now, if you knew where those carrier frequencies are, 
then your signal would lie in a low dimensional subspace. So each one of these options actually has low dimension. How do I know that it has low dimension? Because if I knew where the carrier frequencies were, then I could sample the signal at a very low rate. Right? It's very easy. All I have to do is modulate each one of these guys down to baseband and sample it at a rate proportional to the actual band occupancy. Okay, so the rate associated with one of these guys, if I knew the carrier frequencies, would just be three times the actual band, right? So let's say 3B, if each band has a width of B. And that's what's known in the literature as the Landau rate, okay, the actual band occupancy, which of course has nothing to do with the Nyquist rate. So it doesn't matter what the Nyquist rate is, you could sample it at a low rate, which means that each one of these guys is a subspace of low dimension. Now, the problem is that I don't know which one of the subspaces is the correct subspace, right? I don't know which option is the correct one. Now, what do we do in standard processing when we don't know what the correct option is? Then what we tend to do is to say, OK, if I don't know what the option is, I'm going to look at linear combinations of all options. Now, if you take the linear combinations of all the options here, right, if you take combinations of all of these possibilities, what you end up with is an arbitrary signal that has energy anywhere in the spectrum. And therefore, you are forced to sample at the Nyquist rate. And in fact, like I said, older papers prove, OK, it's a wrong proof, because we're going to show that you don't have to sample at the Nyquist rate. But they prove that you do have to sample at the Nyquist rate by using exactly this argument. OK, if you take a combination of all possibilities, you get an arbitrary signal, band limited to f max, and therefore you have to sample at f max. But what we're going to say is something different. Instead of taking all of the combinations, we're going to represent the signal what we call as a union of subspaces, which means exactly this picture. I'm going to say there's many subspaces. That's the union. There's many possibilities. Each one of them has low dimension. I know that my signal lies in only one of them, but I don't know a priori which one. So instead of having just kind of an estimation problem, I now have a mixed estimation detection problem. I have to estimate the signal within the subspace, and I also have to detect which is the correct option. OK, and mathematically, that is exactly the description of a union of subspaces. OK, so the union allows us to keep the low dimensionality. Each subspace has low dimension. We just add an additional detection parameter. And we'll see that this is what's going to enable us to sample at very low rates and also process at very low rates. OK, so this is really the key. OK, the union modeling is really the important part. So um, let's make this informal. And any questions about the union part? Because that's really key to kind of moving ahead. What? Nothing. OK, this was, OK, now you got a break. And if anybody wants to ask. All right, well, you can ask as I continue as well. OK, so hopefully, right, I've convinced you that it's important to sample at a low rate. Hopefully, I've convinced you that we should be able to sample at a low rate. We have the nice mathematical structure that tells us we could sample at a low rate. But now the question is a practical one. So OK, mathematically, I could prove that there's a structure that has low rate. But how do I actually achieve that low rate in practice? So if you just go ahead and try to sample at a low rate, you're going to get stuck. And let's see that. So let's look at this signal over here. This signal will only have four unknown parameters, right? So just the locations and the amplitudes. So intuitively, we should be able to represent it by four samples. But now if I just go ahead and take four low rate samples, then all of my samples or most of my samples are going to be 0, and they give me no information, right? So obviously, this is not going to get me very far. The same thing is true in the multiband problem. If I just sample part of the bandwidth, then I'm only going to get zeros, and I won't have the information in the signal. Okay, so how do I actually sample at a low rate and still get information? Well, the solution is actually quite easy. So what we're going to do is something that we're always taught not to do. And one of the things that we're taught not to do is not to introduce aliasing. So in any basic DSP course, and I have to admit that I taught this at the Technion also for many years, we teach our students to avoid al aliasing at all costs, right? So no matter what you do, make sure you avoid aliasing. If your life depends on it, avoid aliasing. OK, what we're going to say is exactly the opposite. Aliasing is good for us. So we're going to intentionally introduce aliasing before we sample. OK, so let's take a look at what that's going to look like. So for example, in this poultry model, what we're going to do is we're going to smear the signals by projecting them onto a low dimensional space. We're going to smear the signals before we sample them. Now, why is that good? Because now when we sample the signal, those same samples that were 0 before, now they contain information about the signal. OK, so now these samples are informative. They're telling us something about where these pulses are located. OK, that's the good news. 
The seemingly bad news is that we've lost resolution, right? Because now we get information, but that information is aliased, right? It's combined. But the nice thing is that that we could resolve in the digital domain. So this will allow us to sample at a low rate, and in the digital domain, using clever digital algorithms, we'll be able to get back that resolution. OK, the same thing is true in the multiband problem. So before we sample the signal, we're going to alias it no matter where it came from. We're going to alias all the information down to baseband so that all of these bands are on top of each other. And now we're going to sample the signal. So again, the good news is that we could sample this at a low rate, right, because it only has a low bandwidth. And all the information, all of the signal energy will be within that low bandwidth. OK, the seemingly bad news is that now it's all alias, but like I said, our digital algorithms will be able to resolve it. OK, so this is really the key. We alias the data, we sample it at a low rate, and then we resolve the ambiguity in the digital domain. OK, so <clears throat> just to put this uh, together in a set of principles, so like I said, in this general union model, what we're always going to do is make sure we take all of our options, all of those possibilities of subspaces, and we collapse them onto a low dimensional subspace. OK, so we have an analog projection before we sample. We then go ahead and sample the data at a low rate. And after we've sampled at a low rate, we have two steps in the digital domain. The first is an identification step. OK, we take our low rate sample data and decide which were the subspaces that were active. And that's a detection step. After we've located the active subspaces, we're back to a simple problem, right? Because remember, the first part of the talk we mentioned that standard sampling theory knows how to deal with subspaces. So once I figured out which are the correct subspaces, I could go ahead and recover the data very easily using standard sampling techniques. OK, so the only thing left is how do I identify which subspaces are involved? And this can be done very easily using standard results in the literature. So one way we could do this is by using results on um, subspace tracking. So there's many results in the array processing literature on how to recover subspaces from sample data. OK, now once we've sampled, this becomes a standard digital problem. So we can either use standard array processing methods, or we can use more modern ideas that we've been working on a lot in recent years, these ideas of compressed sensing. So I'll say, I'll say something about that on the next slide. OK, and what's nice, like I said, is that we can also extend these ideas to nonlinear sampling as well. So let me say something about compressed sensing, and this is going to be a very compressed version of compressed sensing. So just out of curiosity, how many people have heard about the term compressed sensing? Wow, OK, very uh, compressed part of the audience. OK, so um, I'm not going to say too much about this, but those of you who haven't heard about it, I encourage you to go read some more. So compressed sensing is a very hot field in the past several years. And basically, it deals with recovering. OK, so it's, it's about vectors, not about continuous signals. But it basically deals with recovering what we call sparse vectors, meaning vectors that could be very, very long, but have only a small number of non-zero values. So it deals with recovering sparse vectors from a small number of measurements. OK, so suppose I have a vector that's very long. Maybe it's of length, let's say 100 or 1,000. But it has only four non-zero values, but I don't know where they are. OK, so from kind of linear algebra, if you have 100 unknowns, you need 100 measurements. But on the other hand, there's only four non-zero values, which means that I only have eight unknowns, right? The non-zero values and their locations. So somehow, instead of having 100 measurements, it seems like eight measurements should be enough, right? Or anything between eight and 100. So what compressed sensing tells us is that, indeed, around eight measurements are enough. And compressed sensing also gives us very efficient recovery algorithms, which I won't go into. That's a whole separate talk on how, from those eight measurements, I could actually recover this entire sparse vector. OK, but the important thing for our discussion is that there's results and methods out there that allow us to recover very long sparse vectors from very short measurements. And this could be done very efficiently. So there's very efficient algorithms to do that. OK, so that's a compressed version of compressed sensing. Now, how are we going to use this? Well, we're going to use this in the following way. So in our case, we don't have vectors, right? We have continuous time signals. But the way we're going to use it is by looking in the digital domain after we've sampled. Remember, after we've sampled, our problem is to locate which subspaces were active from all of our possibilities. So we're going to use compressed sensing basically as an indicator to the active subspaces. OK, so in the digital domain, our measurements are going to be linear combinations of all possible subspaces. And using compressed sensing tools, we could locate which were the active subspaces from a small number of measurements.
Okay, so I know that was pretty quick. Again, I'm not going so much into the technical details, but hopefully it's enough to give you the flavor of why this actually works in practice. Okay, so putting it all together, here's what we do at the end. So we have our continuous time signal. We're going to do analog preprocessing. So we're going to project the signal. This creates the aliasing onto a low dimensional space. We then sample it at a low rate because we projected it onto a low dimension. And then in the digital domain, we use compressed sensing techniques to recover the active subspaces. And once we know the subspaces, we use standard sampling mechanisms in order to recover the signal. OK, so this is kind of the whole stream of, of ideas. OK, so now let me just take a few minutes to see what this is going to look like in concrete applications. So let's start with this multiband problem where we had several bands over a wide spectrum. These could be anywhere in the frequency domain. And in fact, they could be changing very rapidly in time. This is definitely true in defense applications. So we want to be able to do this very rapidly. OK, so let me skip the theory. Let me move right, right ahead to kind of the block diagram of how we sample the signal. So remember, what we said is what we're going to do is we're going to alias the signal before we sample it. And the way we do that in hardware conveniently is by multiplying the signal with a periodic function. OK, now why does that give us aliasing? Because let's think about it. If I multiply with a periodic function, then in the frequency domain, I'm performing convolution. And we know that any periodic function could be written in the frequency domain as a stream of deltas, right? And that's true for any periodic function. Now, if I convolve with the stream of deltas, I'm exactly creating aliasing. OK, why? Because what is convolving with the delta train do? It takes your signal, right? It shifts it to the right. It shifts it to the left and sums everything up. So what I'm getting is exactly this picture. All of these guys, no matter where they were to begin with, they're all going to fold on top of each other. And this is what I'm going to see in baseband. OK, so now all I have to do after this folding is uh, filter the signal in baseband and then sample it in baseband. So I can now sample at a very low rate and at a low analog bandwidth, because this signal over here has low analog bandwidth, no matter where the signal started from. OK, so this is how we do the sampling in practice. It's very simple. You see, there's nothing very sophisticated here in terms of hardware. It's very simple. All we do is multiply with the periodic function. And in practice, what we do is we use a bit flip sequence, just because that's the easiest for us periodic function to generate. And now, once we've sampled, we're going to get this alias version of the signal. And then we're going to go ahead and use compressed sensing ideas to recover it, right? Because conceptually, our data, this is our data. And what it's going to look like is linear combinations of these guys, right? If you think of each of these guys as representing one of these bins, our data is going to be linear combinations of it. And therefore, we could use compressed sensing in order to recover it. OK, so that's the main idea. And this is the hardware that we've actually built in the lab. So this was the first prototype that we've built. Um, what you see over here is a sampler that takes signals with 2.4 gigahertz and samples them at 280 megahertz. So it's, it's about a ninth reduction in sampling rate. This is the analog board. So here we do the multiplying, the filtering, and the, low pass, and the low rate sampling. And here you get the samples coming out over here. This is a digital board that just creates that bit flip sequence. OK, now this is not the best way to do it. This is the way we did it um, in our labs. But of course, if we were doing it in industry, we, we would be able to do this much more efficiently. But the important thing is that even you know, with our means that we had at the Technion, which are not very sophisticated, we were able to build this and show that it actually works in practice. So here are some scope shots, just so that you see that this um, actually works with real signals, not only on paper. So here we see an example of three signals, an FM, an AM, and a sign. These were just randomly generated with random carrier frequencies, which of course we don't know in advance. After going through the hardware, we see all of these guys alias down to baseband. So this is what you see over here. You see the FM and the AM and the sign kind of riding on the FM, all alias down to baseband. And after going through our recovery method, which we implemented in FPGA, so again, it's very efficient. It's easy to do in FPGA. We get each one of the signals individually recovered, even though we sampled at a very low rate. OK, so this actually works in practice as well. So those of you interested, I'm going through this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of information on our web page. So we have a GUI package that simulates the entire system. Um, we have lots of demos of our hardware. So the problem in, in uh, academia was that people actually didn't really believe us that it works, right? Because people are very held on to this conception that you cannot beat the Nyquist rate. So writing papers wasn't enough. Building a prototype wasn't enough. People wanted to see with their own eyes that this works. So we had several demos of the prototype where we basically just went to conferences and allowed people to come and input their own signals into the, the hardware and just see in real time that it actually recovers the inputs. OK, so those of you interested, there's a lot of information on our web page. There's some recordings of the demo, so you could go ahead and take a look. 
Okay, so let me just um, take two more minutes to go through the other applications. I'm not going to go through the details because they're exactly the same. So the same ideas we used in this problem, we could use in all of the examples I showed you in the radar, in ultrasound, in multipath. Okay, so in all of those examples, the idea is exactly the same. We alias the data, we sample it at a low rate, and then we use these compressed sensing ideas in order to recover the underlying signal, and everything is done at a very low rate. Okay, so let's just look at the, the, these are just some of the examples, but let's go look, take a look at the final results. So first of all, this was the radar problem. Here, what we're showing is that not only could we sample at a low rate, but we actually get much better resolution than we get with the original methods. So this aliasing and the type of processing that we do even could increase your resolution if you do it correctly. And this is what we see in the radar problem, and we could prove that theoretically as well. But what's interesting in radar is actually not to look at these scenarios, which have pretty good SNR, but actually to look at the very low SNR regime. And one of the things that people are always concerned about when we present these ideas is that, okay, maybe it works when the SNR is very high, but when you have noise, somehow it has to stop working. So what we want to show is that it continues to work. So this is the hardware that we developed uh, for the radar problem. Now, if you look at this hardware, it looks much cleaner than the previous hardware that I showed, and that's because the first prototype we actually did alone in the lab, so me and my student, and neither of us are, are RF people, right? We just wanted to prove that the concept is actually doable. Uh, the second prototype, we got smarter, and we already hired an engineer who actually knows how to do these things. So it looks a little bit cleaner, but it's the same principles. Um, so here's an example of what we get from the radar case. This is using real data from a hardware, and this is minus 25 dB, okay? So minus 25 dB is really low. It's a very, very low SNR. And what we see here is that we don't get perfect detection anymore, but that's okay because standard processing, match filtering, doesn't get perfect detection either. But while with the match filter, we would only get two out of the five targets, in our case, we actually got four out of the five targets. And again, this was at a tenth of the Nyquist rate. So we're saving both sampling and processing rates and getting better detection performance. Um, just to convince you that this actually works, so here's a plot of, what, of the hit rate that we get as a function of the SNR. So you see that even though the SNR is very, very low, we're going here from minus 25 to minus 15 dB, we get almost perfect detection all of the time. Okay, at minus 25 dB, we start dropping, and this is gonna go down and down and down, and eventually it will fall. Okay, so if you have really, really low SNR, like minus 40 dB SNR, then these methods will start collapsing because there's just not enough measurements, right? From four samples and very, very noisy environments, I can't get back the information. But the good thing is that that threshold where we start losing performance is very, very low, and therefore for practical applications, these methods actually work in practice. Okay, so let me wrap up by just showing the ultrasound example. So this is uh, the ultrasound data. It's a bit confusing because when I showed the original example, there was a picture of a baby. And then people look at this and kind of identify the baby, right? Here's the head, here's the body. But actually, this is cardiac data, okay? So this is actually a heart. There's no baby here. But anyway, okay, so what you see over here, this is true data that we were given uh, by GE. And cardiac data is very important to them because here, actually, processing rates are very important. You want to be able to process the signal very fast because the, the, the heart moves while you're scanning the heart. So what you see over here is what you would get with standard imaging, okay, at the Nyquist rate. What you see over here is using our methods where we're sampling at a seventh of the Nyquist rate. So actually there's a, essentially no difference between these two images. So we went down to a seventh of the Nyquist rate and we get essentially the same image. Here, just for fun, we went all the way to one over 25th of the Nyquist rate. Okay, that's very, very extreme. So we don't expect to get perfect recovery anymore, but it still looks pretty good, okay? So there's some distortion here, but if what you care about are these boundaries, which is the case, at least in some applications, in this cardiac data, then the boundaries are still preserved. So for some clinical purposes, this will actually still be good enough. But anyway, even if it's not good enough, it's interesting to see that you could go all the way down to 25th of the rate, and the performance is not that bad. Okay, obviously, something in between the 7th and the 25th will give us good performance and we'll get a tremendous amount of savings. So finally, just to wrap up, as I said, we could also extend these ideas to the case where we have nonlinear sampling. So we could combine these ideas, and this is very important in optics, with phase retrieval problems. So problems where we only have the magnitude of the data. And the nice thing is that, again, by exploiting the structure and by doing sampling in this form, we could get both bandwidth extrapolation, so increased resolution, and also compensate for the fact that we don't know the phase. So we could do both phase retrieval and bandwidth extrapolation, okay, and all of this is just by exploiting the structure in the signal. So 
this goes back to the example I showed at the beginning. Like I said, in this example, we, we lose all of the high frequency content, so we're only seeing essentially a low pass version of the signal. And what's worse is that we're not getting the phase, we're only getting the magnitude of that low pass regime. But again, by using the tools that I've just described, we could get perfect recovery of the signal. And like I said, we could extend this to more general phase retrieval problems as well. So to wrap up, what we've showed is that we could get compressed sampling of many, many classes of signals or many signals of interest. We could sample them at low rates. We could process them at low rates. And the hardware is actually relatively simple. There's, it's not like we're coming across with some very wacky new way of designing ADD converters, but we're using very standard building blocks. It's just that putting them together the correct way allows us to get the benefits. So the, the kind of take home message is that by exploiting the structure, we could get new ways of thinking about sampling, new ways of thinking about processing, and the Nyquist rate becomes no longer relevant to our applications. Okay, so really what I'm showing, of course, is work in progress. These are ideas that we've just been working on in the past few years, and hopefully others will be interested, both theoretically and also in industry, so that we could really kind of combine forces and get these ideas out there. We really believe in them. I believe that we're generating too much data, right? The world is full of noise, and we're definitely generating too much data. We don't need all of this data in order to get the results that we want. And what we really believe in and hope that we'll be able to promote is that by using these ideas or, or similar ideas, right, people will obviously come along and, and think about how to do what we did in a better way, which is, which is great. But by using these types of concepts, hopefully, we'll be able to tremendously reduce the amount of data that we take and get much better ways of processing it. So this also has a green aspect to it that we could reduce power if we do things in the correct way. So those of you concerned with the fact that there were no proofs or math, I promise you there's a lot of math behind this. You could go ahead and take a look at some of the references. Uh, there's a lot of detail on our web page. We also have a recent book on compressed sensing where you could find a lot of the basic ideas and mathematical proofs. And thank you very much for your attention. So I'm happy to take questions. If, if any, I'm, I'm happy to take questions if anybody wants to ask anything. It should be the situation where the energy of the signal itself must spread. It, it, it will not come only to the baseband. It will also be replicated in other uh, uh, frequencies. This means that the energy of the, of the pulse, of the information, will be reduced. Therefore, uh, it was uh, not clear how, how, how with a low SNR it can be now. With higher SNR, it's, it's understandable, but with a lower SNR, I, I, okay. I couldn't very, very good question. Good. So when, when people ask that question, I know that they were following the main idea. So that's a very, very good question. And indeed, we address that. So, so you're right. Let me, let me repeat the question when, in kind of different words a little bit. When we, if you think about the multiband problem, when we alias the information, we're also aliasing the noise. So the SNR is not preserved, right? The signal energy ver relative to the noise energy becomes lower. And that's indeed true. But the important thing is that in the recovery, if you remember, I split it to detection and estimation. So for the detection purposes, I don't need such a high SNR, right? It's easier to detect than to estimate. So in order to detect which are the correct subspaces, I could operate even at a reduced SNR. And that's what saves me. So as long as the detector is working correctly, once I do the estimation, I'm already working within a subspace, and then my SNR is, is increased again, because I narrow myself into a, an individual subspace. So I just need the SNR to be such that at the detector, I'm still working correctly, and that's what helps me. There's also tricks in the digital domain. It's true that if you just look kind of at the raw SNR after the sampler, then my SNR is reduced, and actually by the factor of the Nyquist rate to the undersampling rate. But in the digital domain, I could actually gain some of that back by using clever detection methods. So it's not as bad, as, it's not as severe as that factor. I still have a reduction. Okay, it's not as severe as you would think, but I still, I still do have a loss. But again, because my first step is a detection step, I only have to pass the detection threshold. And that's why, like I said, let's say in the radar example, I will have a threshold. And under that threshold, my performance will be very bad. But as long as that threshold is low enough, I'm still good. Okay, so it, it, it plays a role. If it wouldn't play a role, then this would be true at any SNR. So it will play a role, but the important thing is that as long as it works up to a low enough threshold, then I'm okay. Okay, so, and we have mathematical techniques, of course, for determining what that threshold is, so.
Okay, so there I was talking about the radar problem, but I'm measuring input SNR. Okay, so that's the SNR at the input. Over the pulse. I'm measuring the SNR over the pulse. Okay, this, this was a different problem. The radar problem was the, the pulse. But the standard way you measure SNR and radar, I'm just doing it at the input, not at the output. I'm measuring input SNR. Yeah. I'm not doing it in the bandwidth. I'm doing it in time, not in frequency. So I have a pulse, and I'm measuring the SNR within the pulse, the signal-to-noise ratio within the pulse. OK. All right. So I'm happy to take one more question. I do have to run to the Technion because I'm teaching at 11.30. So let's take one more question. And then you could contact me uh, by email, and I'll be happy to take more questions. The number of occupied bands or the number of? Uh, yeah, so your sampling rate, OK, your sampling rate is always going to be proportional to the number of bands you're trying to detect. Right? That's always true. If you have more, more real information, then your sampling rate will increase. OK, but as long as you're sampled at a sufficient rate, meaning at a rate proportional to the actual bands, regardless of the Nyquist rate, but it has to be proportional to the actual bands. As long as you're proportional to the actual bands, then your performance will be the same. But you have to sample at a high enough rate. Yeah, but then there's no, I mean, if it's 37 out of 40, it's not worth the effort, right? I mean, the, the, the cases that are interesting is where you have a very wide spectrum and only a few small bands. If it's 37 out of 40, then honestly, just use the Nyquist rate. I mean, it's not worth the effort, right? OK, so I'm, I'm very happy. I'm, I really feel bad that I have to take off, but I'm, I must go teach at the Technion. So, um, but I'm very happy to have discussions who anyone interesting, you could contact me by email, and we could definitely follow up by phone or email. So thank you very much. <laughs>